Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this panel on Sonic Spaces Gendered Soundscapes. Um, I am tuning in from a very blustery dingle, so hopefully my Wi-Fi lasts so that I can <laughs> appropriately chair this panel for you. Um, this panel today is going to be discussing the ways in which sonic spaces can reflect broader social and cultural issues around gender and representation. Um, we have three panellists. Um, Dr. Megan McGurk, Dr. Anne Clear, and Dr. Jilly Boyce Kay, who I'll, I'll introduce uh, briefly before um, uh, each panelist uh, presents. Um, and at the end, um, we'll um, be taking questions and answers. Um, so I will um, be taking note of questions as they come in. Um, and present them um, in the second half of uh, the portion of, of the panel. Um, so first um, up today, uh, we have Dr. Megan McGurk, uh, who is the host of the popular podcast and film club, Sassmouth Dames, um, which is devoted uh, to what women who ruled the Hollywood box office from the 1930s through the 1950s. Hello, thanks very much for joining us this evening and uh, inviting me. So uh, I have just a couple of slides uh, to sort of illustrate things. So um, I've been hosting the, uh, the film club since 2017 and uh, the podcast since 2018. And when I talk to women about it, one of the things that almost always comes up is the Bechdel test. And women ask, do your films pass the Bechdel test? And I try to um, invite them to recognize the limitations of the Bechdel test and that it might have uses uh, or be useful for showing people um, to be aware of how much women speak on screen as compared to men. But in the era of film that I generally cover from 1930 through the 40s and 50s, um, the Bechdel test is, doesn't apply and it's not really useful because um, the films that I use are, or, or cover are called woman's pictures. And during the American studio system in Hollywood, um, they were films that were made for women, um, for a female audience. And the stars uh, who got top billing uh, were top of the box office and made top salary um, were featured in films that had them get the best of men, that had them be uh, the ones with quicker wits, um, who got ahead by using their brains and their sense of resourcefulness. So the idea that women couldn't, uh, you know, uh, we have to measure that they can't talk about men wouldn't work at all, especially during the depression era. One way that women got ahead or increased their chances for social mobility would be to talk about men, to see how they could get over on them, how they could get a leg up on them. So I say, if you're looking for a picture that doesn't, um, you know, um, you know, have women talking about men, you'd be in the wrong era and area, but you'd miss out a lot. So one of the greatest pleasures in life to me is watching a picture like The Mad Miss Manton, a screwball comedy from 1938, which is a scene of it here on my slide, where Barbara Stanwyck leads a pack of her socialites to solve uh, a crime, a series of crimes. And in it, they have to battle the police, the press, and the criminal you know, mastermind who's committing all these murders. So the idea that they wouldn't talk about men is kind of you know, beside the point. They they do talk about men, but the assumption in the Bechdel test sometimes seems to be like if women talked about men, it would be because they thought men were more important or they were prior prioritizing men, but that's not the case at all. I mean, in one scene or several scenes, Barbara Stanwyck says, get them girls, and sends her pack of socialites on Henry Fonda to beat him up, to tie him up, and basically just get him out of the way so they can continue doing what they're doing. So the idea that women talk about men is just part of living in a man's world. It doesn't mean that you know they think men are better. Now what's happening on screen is in many ways mirrored in what's behind it. 
in when we talk about women's voices, it's not just in the script, but it's in their, um, you know, their careers in that if we look at the politics behind a screen test or an audition for women, it's very much determined from their, you know, the moment that they appear. Many women weren't even given, um, you know, a screen test with sound, that they were really chosen for their body or their face. As in Lana Turner had one line in her um, screen test for her first picture, but really what they wanted to get was her walking around in a tight sweater. Uh, that's what got her the job and got her the studio contract. But even with that limitation, she still banked a very long career that was built on her voice and not just on her body. And the same with Ava Gardner. Ava Gardner, both in her personal life and on the screen was more than just her looks, even though she may have just been chosen um, initially for that uh, purpose. But women didn't, um, she, they didn't stay limited by that sort of um, you know, reckoning. We can also look at lots of women who talk about how they consider they were considered to have a problem voice, like Jean Tierney. When she first saw herself on screen, she was mortified and took up smoking and then even heavy smoking because she thought it was good for her voice. It would make it deeper. It would make it sound less um, girly or weak. The same with Lauren Bacall, who was instructed by Howard Hawks, who wanted to play a Spengali type figure for her and um, counseled her to uh, learn how to read um, and speak deeply with a deeper voice and lose that girlishness, which when she comes to her first starring picture to have and have not with Humphrey Bogart, she's 19, he's 44. So if she sounds like a girl, that might be a little unnerving for audiences. So she has to sound like a woman with a deep throaty voice. So we don't get creeped out by the fact that she's you know, now um, a romantic interest for a middle-aged man old enough to be her father. Um, so, you know, this idea of shaping women's voices doesn't just happen on the screen, it happens off screen as well. One of the things that I like is, you know, that uh, one of my obsessions, especially during this awful period is um, tracking down not only what women um, wrote for the screen, women like Anita Luce, the author of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, who wrote a lot of screenplays, is how women wrote for other women, and then also how women wrote back to the studio system in their memoirs and autobiographies, where they tell stories of, um, you know, what it was like to be only desired for your body on screen, someone like Esther Williams, who made a you know a million dollars for MGM as uh, as a mermaid uh, type figure, but then wrote one of the most scathing and juicy autobiographies out there. Um, so even if we didn't get a whole lot of her voice on camera or on screen for her career, we got a lot of it after the fact. So ways that there are these sort of compensatory measures that women took um, in the sound system to give themselves more of a voice. And so the idea of voice echoes, it's the pleasure of watching women talk on screen with each other. I, I find nothing more pleasurable than watching women tear men to shreds on screen and just rip them apart for their cheap ploys and you know their um, pig-headedness and their privilege. And then do the same thing after the fact in their memoirs when they talk about the producers and the studio heads and the co-stars that they had. It's just delicious. And so if you're limiting yourself to the Bechtel test, you're missing out on so much. You're missing out on 30 uh, years of great films made for women. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. McGurk. Um, and as I said, at the end, we'll, um, we'll, we'll take questions. Um, next up, we have Dr. Anne Clear, who is a multi-award winning composer and assistant professor in Trinity's Music and Media Technologies program. Um, and she's going to in introduce uh, Sounding the Feminists which is an Irish-based collective committed to promoting and publicizing the creative work of female musicians. Hi everyone, uh, nice to be here tonight. Uh, so yes, I am here uh, to talk to you about Sounding the Feminists. Uh, so I'm just gonna share uh, some information from Sounding the Feminists website um, because that's where most of our uh, information is. 
and just talk you through, I guess, how the, the group was founded, uh, why it was founded, and what kind of work we've been doing over the past few years. Uh, so Sounding the Feminists is an Irish-based, voluntary-led collective of composers, sound artists, performers, musicologists, critics, promoters, industry professionals, organisations and individuals committed to promoting and publish, publicising the creative work of female musicians. So I guess, you know, that's a, a large uh, amount of people to involve, but really, I suppose we wanted this to be a collective uh, for for both practicing and musicians and supporters of music to be involved in. Um, so our mission statement um, is that STF, so that's uh, short for sounding the feminists, recognizes that contemporary attitudes, policies and practices towards music and gender are often built on institutions and traditions that resist change. In solidarity with groundbreaking sister movements such as Waking the Feminists, the STF Working Group was established in 2017. We aim to take positive action to improve the representation of women island-wide who, who are working in many areas of the music sector. We seek to do so by work, working with partner groups on the following priority areas. So we would like to address gender balance issues intersectional feminism across music sectors, uh, to create new systems to promote gender fairness across promoters, venues, funders, educators, curators, musicians, to build a community where gender issues of or where gen issues of gender can be discussed, to organize and audit areas of the Irish music sector in relation to gender balance to liaise with educational organizations and institutions throughout the country, uh, to liaise with international groups such as Fair Play and Female Pressure. And I should also add Irish groups that we've had a lot of contact with, uh, like Manawsome, uh, Girls Rock Dublin, also Fair Play in Ireland as well. Uh, and lastly, to encourage younger generations of musicians to become involved in these debates. Um, so I suppose we, we landed on these these priority areas uh, through through I suppose looking at um, different situations where we did see a, a, a underrepresentation of women uh, in various uh, music sectors across Ireland, um, and to work on that I suppose at first well really this is as I, as we say a movement so there are a lot of uh, people involved and community involved, but we also have a working group um, so that we can, uh, I suppose, work on applications and projects and so on um, uh, and and kind of prioritize what needs to be done. Uh, and the working group, I should say, um, the chair is Karen Power. Uh, I am projects officer. Uh, Laura Watson is education officer. And then we've also had a previous working group uh, members uh, like Jenny O'Connor Madsen, Amanda Fury, Grace Talon, and also I should mention Jane DC. Um, so I guess, uh, as I said, we founded the group in 2017, um, but began work mainly in 2016. Um, uh, I suppose our, that's when our, our, our main kind of work began as STF, and even in 2016, we were. Uh, um, known as com uh, composing uh, the feminists as well. Um, and this was, I suppose, in relation to uh, a festival that was held at the National Concert Hall. Um, so if, if you remember in 2016, uh, the Abbey held their festival, uh, Waking the Nation, um, and uh, composing the island was, I suppose, a similar uh, project uh, but for uh, art music in the National Concert Hall. Um, and looking at this festival, which was held in autumn of 2016, um, a wide group of us uh, in Composing the Feminists uh, looked at the programme uh, and analysed uh, various um, aspects of it, such as um, how many uh, minutes were performed, were, were was there um, performed by um, 
various groups. So I'll just show you actually um, a snapshot of our findings from that. Just one moment. Um, so as you can see here, um, these were just a few points um, from the analysis that we took of this specific uh, festival of music. But as I say, um, these were things that we were seeing kind of in a lot of festivals in Ireland, around the world, uh, and even in, in other situations too, like recording practices and so on. But as an example, um, the festival that um, I'm, I'm referencing here, uh, there was 197 minutes of music from female composers versus 870 minutes from male composers. So even in terms of, you know, what we're talking about tonight, uh, this idea of space and even what um, Megan was talking about earlier with, um, you know, uh, this perception of how much we're hearing or seeing women, um, you know, that's a huge difference between 197 minutes and 870 minutes across a, a month long festival. Also, there were 12 men who had 30, more than 30 minutes of uh, program time. Um, and, and therefore, they were kind of truly celebrated and written into history. And then there was just one living composer, a uh, female living composer, Deirdre Gribben, who had more than 30 minutes of music. Um, also to note, if every living composer on the festival was just represented with one piece, there would have been space for 39 more pieces. Um, so again, there was a, a very much a focus on certain people and uh, kind of writing them into history in a way. Uh, all commissions, any new commissions for the festival uh, were given to male composers uh, until pianist Isabel O'Connell offered to add uh, a concert to the festival. It was planned that all six solo performers in the festival would be men. Um, then there were other concerts from composers uh, who are also performers, and those were also male artists only. Um, any piece that included electronics or video were also by male composers. So there weren't any pieces in the festival um, that showed that women also work with electronic media. Um, and then there were four composer, four pieces included by composers under the age of 30, and all of these composers were male. Um, also to mention, in, just in terms of present representation, I suppose, there was an awful lot of photos of women in the brochures, but there weren't actually any living female composers mentioned in the brochures introduction, uh, where the kind of importance of the festival would be uh, highlighted. Um, so I suppose that's just a snapshot really of, um, you know, uh, underrepresentation that we were seeing uh, everywhere really across the world. So STF, I suppose um, we we worked on um, our, our mission statement and our priorities in terms of, of ideas like this of underrepresentation. Um, and one of our, our main ways of, of looking at that was to work, as I said earlier, in partnership with um, various organizations um, such as, as you can see here, uh, Music Network, um, Irish National Opera, the Contemporary Music Centre, uh, the Irish Baroque Orchestra, the Contempo Quartet, uh, the D Department of Music at Maynooth, uh, Quiet Music Ensemble, Dundalk IT. Um, and in working with those partner organizations, in partnering with them, I suppose we've been working on ways um, to change how they make decisions and um, to work with them, I suppose, on, on sharing power in a way um, and, and sharing their programming um, uh, abilities. Um, and one of, I suppose, our, our main partners now are the National Concert Hall. Uh, who I mentioned um, uh, had programmed this uh, festival that we had the, the analysis on. Um, and we've worked really hard with the concert hall to come up with new ways of, of how they uh, program and present music. And um, that has been through a mixture of, well, previous to uh, the pandemic, uh, we worked on um, uh, different strands, really commissioning strands, where they commission um, uh, work from female composers, which they hadn't previously, they hadn't really commissioned a lot of music in general. 
um, a chamber series where they uh, present historic repertoire that hadn't previously uh, been presented. Um, and also at the moment, we uh, have kind of had to reinvent that. So to make it a bit more useful to um, practicing artists during the pandemic. Um, so this year we worked on an expansion of that scheme uh, and we now have three strands. Uh, we have um, commissioning, uh, recording and a project award. Um, so again, these are projects that, that prior to Sounding the Feminists just really weren't in existence at the concert hall. Um, so these are new opportunities for established and emerging um, female composers uh, to now work there and create work in a way that they want to create work. Um, and also just very briefly to mention a few other projects. Uh, so we have developed uh, professional development workshops with IMRO. IMRO have been a fantastic partner too. Um, we've also had um, a statistical analysis with the Contemporary Music Centre. Um, so this was looking at gender balance in publicly funded opportunities for composers across the island of Ireland over the past 30 years. So we've begun that project with um, CMC and uh, we'll be continuing that as well. Um, and then you can see on the rest of our website, there's various other projects where uh, we've partnered with organizations to try and work with them on, on how to, um, I suppose, democratize um, uh, decision-making and um, programming decisions and so on, um, and to, to find ways forward um, towards a more egalitarian uh, music society. Um, so that's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Clear. Um, before moving on to our third and final panelists, um, I'd just like to, to remind all participants um, to please feel free to engage um, with the Q&A um, and participate in the conversation, um, which will be opening up to everybody um, towards the end in the second half of the panel. Um, so, Finally, we have Dr. Jilly Boyce Kay, who is a lecturer in media and communication at the University of Leicester and author of Gender, Media and Voice. Um, and she'll be discussing the ways that feminist voices on television were construed as domestic nags in the 1970s. Great, thank you. Can I just double check that you can see my slides okay? Are they showing? Okay. Yeah. Do you know what, if you just wanna make sure they're on, on presentation mode. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, is that better? That's perfect. Great. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks for two really wonderful talks so far. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk um, briefly about some of my research into um, a television programme that was broadcast in 1973, um, which is seldom now remembered, um, if at all. Um, it's called No Man's Land. Um, it was a six part uh, pre-recorded debate programme that went out on Saturday evenings on UK television. Um, it was produced by Associated Television, the ITV franchise holder for the Midlands, but it was broadcast um, across the UK regions on a Saturday night. Um, it was broadcast by uh, Juliet Mitchell, um, who, was, who is a prominent intellectual um, and she was a really key activist um, in the women's liberation uh, movement in the 60s, 70s and beyond. Uh, she is author of the path-breaking text, um, Women, the Longest Revolution, um, and also uh, uh, Women's Estate, among many other texts. Um, so I want to talk about this programme because I think it's a really significant text in the history of second wave uh, feminism um, in the UK and the way that it was mediated, but I think it can also tell us something really important and significant about the ways that women's and particularly feminist voices um, have, have been registered and heard. Um, and I want to suggest that, that on television, women's and feminist voices in particular are often uh, registered and heard as a form of nagging. <clears throat> So um, this was the six part television program. There were uh, the six episodes were on uh, women and marriage, women and sexuality, women and work, women and education, women alone and the image of women. 
Um, and I think it's really significant that this actually this program was was broadcast um, on commercial television on a Saturday night, which in and of itself is quite remarkable. And I can't really imagine that happening in the same way now. Um, and the audience itself was quite remarkable for its participants. The stu studio audience included people like Jermaine Greer, Anne Oakley, Sheila Robotham, various Labour MPs, um, actresses, including Prunella Scales, um, and many, many others. And I wish that I could screen a part of the programme for you, but unfortunately, the only way to watch it is to travel to the BFI archives and watch an analogue version. So unfortunately, uh, um, because of the nature of the archive, it, I'm, it's, I'm un unable to, to share it with you. Um, so in terms of, um, of women's public speech, we know from scholars such as Mary Beard that there is what Beard calls um, a culturally awkward relationship between women and the public sphere. Um, of speech making, debate and comment. Um, so Mary Beard um, has, has argued that in ancient Rome, public speech was, if not the, um, was a, if not the defining attribute of maleness. So a woman speaking in public was in most circumstances by definition, not a woman. Um, and so femininity became defined by its exclusion from the public sphere and public speech making. And of course, these gendered legacies still powerfully shape um, the public sphere. Um, however, when it comes to television within media studies, um, many of the dominant historical accounts of television talk present a generally optimistic account of its relationship to socio-political change. Um, so scholars such as Paddy Scannell and others have broadly argued that broadcasting has democratized public speech through facilitating a kind of new openness to, um, to ordinary voices against the exclusionary elitism of earlier periods. So broadcast talk, unlike other forms of public speech, such as that which is uttered from a lecture podium, for example, broadcast talk does not have a captive audience. So because it's received within the domestic context, viewers are simply free to, to switch the television off or over to another channel if they feel that they are being got at in Paddy Scannell's terms. Um, and so Sc Scannell calls the resulting communicative ethos of broadcast talk um, sociability. So he sees this as what characterizes broadcast talk, a kind of sociable, open, friendly kind of talk. Um, so according to this conceptualization, broadcast talk has transformed the power relations of public speaking and public culture more broadly. Um, television talk and broadcast talk for Scannell has quote, unobtrusively con contributed to the democratization of everyday life, unquote. However, I think that the domestic conditions of television reception have actually often had a much more ambivalent or even um, problematic implications for women's voices on television. So because within the context of domestic space, women's speech is often framed as that uh, of an insufferable nagging wife. Um, and this too has been the case with women's television voices. So to turn back to No Man's Land, um, each episode began with an introduction in which Juliet Mitchell um, um, set out the premise of each episode. So for example, in the episode Women and Work, she began by saying, uh, women make up well over a third of our workforce. We, conveni we conveniently forget this fact and blithely expect them to do two jobs at home and at work. And then because we so complacently believe um, that they are really at home supported by a man, we pay them less, give them a far narrower, narrower range of choice of training opportunities and possibilities of promotion. So here, um, Juliet Mitchell um, um, is kind of addressing audience members um, as part of a social problem. So we pay them less, we so complacently believe, etc. And so here, this is, I think this is a complicated scandal's idea that broadcast talk must not get at its audience. So, you know, that's precisely what she was doing here. She was sort of getting at the audience, implicating them as part of this problem. Um, indeed, the whole premise of the series was not to affiliate to the arrangements of the domestic context of its reception, um, to, to speak in a friendly way to, you know, so that it's received in this kind of welcome way within the domestic space, but precisely to overthrow the conditions of the domestic sphere by getting at the whole gendered structure of society. And indeed, the programme was widely understood in the mainstream press reviews as a form of getting at um, the domestic audience, um, or as I want to call it, as a form of televisual nagging. 
Um, so for example, in the Daily Mail, uh, Virginia Ironside wrote, the Juliet Mitchell lot seem to wallow in moaning. It doesn't dawn on them that a few simple but positive films of shared marriages that really work would have a far greater influence on husbands who still see the sink as women's work than any amount of complaints and what can only be described as typically feminine self-pity and nagging. Um, so nagging is typically understood as um, a woman's tenacious and complaining address to men. So as Megan Morris has argued, nag nagging or the, the women's compla woman's complaint is defined as, quote, unsuccessful repetition of the same statements. Nagging is a mode of repetition which fails to produce the de desired effects of difference that might allow the complaint to end, unquote. Um, but Juliet Mitchell had, had written in Women's Estate um, that the concept um, of women's consciousness raising was in fact um, based on a kind of speech mode of complaint. So she says it was a reworking of a Chinese peasant revolutionary practice of speaking bitterness. Um, and Mitchell wrote that this practice is, um, quote, the bringing to consciousness of the virtually unconscious oppression. One person's realization of an injustice brings to mind other injustices for the whole group, unquote. So here, the normatively negative association, associations of bitterness are reworked into something generative, productive and collective. So as such, while nagging seems like a subordinate mode of speech associated with feminine abjection and miserable stasis, um, it can also be kind of reclaimed, I think, and it also has the capacity to reveal the insufferability of a situation. And when nagging is expressed in public contexts, it can help to galvanize um, a collective response. Um, so, and women who have transgressed the limits of acceptable speech on television um, and who have failed to be appropriately smiling and friendly um, have often been castigated as nags, gossips, scolds, and hysterics. So Scannell's um, conflation of sociability with democratization, suggesting that being friendly is equates with being democratic, um, would necessarily position this kind of earnest, complaining, didactic talk of no man's land as undemocratic. But I would want to suggest, argue that we should reconceive of women's talk that is complaining and nagging and angry and bitter as part of what is a precisely democratic um, struggle for women's voices in the public sphere. And that's the end of that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Kay. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, great range of topics um, being spoken on in relation to gendered soundscapes here. Um, and we have had um, a few um, questions and comments come in. Um, and again, um, I'd like to invite um, participants to participate in the, the Q&A by um, entering questions and comments, um, which I will then um, address to panellists. Um, and uh, I'd also invite um, our panellists to, to review the, the Q&A if, if any of you wanted to type um, responses, but um, would be great to, to get a kind of uh, more general um, chat and dialogue going. And by all means, if you have any questions for each other, um, please feel free. Um, we so um, I think I'll just dive right in in the interest of, of time so that we can um, cover as many participants questions as, as possible and as they come in. Um, I. Oh, sorry. Yes. OK, <laughs> looking at the, the, the right uh, thread. Um, We've had a, a we have a, a comment um, f uh, in response to um, Dr. McGurk um, about um, the use of um, the Bechdel test. Um, a comment being um, that it variably can be taken literally or or not literally as 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 a means to you know measure um, a film, and it obviously has its um, pitfalls. Um, when taken literally, um, I was wondering if you wanted to, to comment further on, on, on how you've used it uh, or critiqued it as um, a framework uh, for um, how um, these films uh, that you're looking at 
have have in, indeed themselves been critiqued or how they how they shouldn't be um where it might might be helpful but also how uh how it, it clearly does not do justice to um uh, these issues of, of speech and uh, commentary. Um, I suppose I, I think of it maybe more um, has a modern application or to modern films, meaning probably those done in the last 30 years or so. Um, but if we're talking about the time period that I focus on for the podcast or for, um, you know, when I had the luxury of screening live cinema um, for the films then, um, it doesn't apply because films were made for women um, so that they didn't need the Bechdel test. It was beside the point. So if you look through the box office returns between 1930 and 1950, you'll see women dominating the top 10. So that meant that the pictures they made were profitable. People went to see them, not just women, but they were primarily women's stories, meaning women got the top billing. They took up the majority of the script. Um, the stories were about what was most meaningful to them, whether it's how to get ahead in a career, uh, their family problems, romantic problems, problems with their friends. Um, so they were women's stories populated by women. And it seems almost crazy now to think about men being secondary characters, men who are second build or only have a few lines and don't even have the best lines. They don't get the best jokes. They don't get the best sort of wisecracks. So if we try and apply the Bechdel test, it seems almost pointless because everything in the cinematic universe in a woman's picture is for women. Even when the story seems to be about men, like something like Dodsworth, a great picture uh, starring Walter Houston, but it's really about the women in his life and what he sort of expects of women or you know, that he spent all of these years as an industrialist, as a businessman, and now he wants you know, to enjoy life. So in other words, um, it became necessary because for so many years, women's pictures didn't exist so then, you know, the Bechdel test seemed to be a tool to use to say, okay, how can we um, discuss women's voices on screen in a meaningful way? Do we hear enough from them? But in women's pictures, um, they never shut up. They talk all the time. And if they talk about men, I'm okay with that because there's no greater pleasure, like I said, than hearing women talk shit about men on screen. Like, I love it. Um, the, the women, which is, you know, famous for having 134 women in the cast and no men, no, no men are represented on screen in any way, even in art or in the books that are used in the film. And they talk about men, but the men are so beside the point. The men, they could change like their fashion, you know, um, or having their hair done over, going to the salon every week. The men are beside the point. It's all about the women. So um, I don't think the Bechdel test is really useful, but I understand why people want a tool to measure how much women speak on um, screen because it, we have so few women's voices. You know, if a woman gets 35% of the screen time, then it's considered a lot. And that's a problem, but it's not the way we should evaluate women's pictures from a different era that were made specifically for a woman audience. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, and what uh, also struck me um, when uh, you were talking, um, Megan, uh, about, you know, uh, voice and speech, uh, especially regarding men as, you know, compensatory um, measure um, or, or that, the, you know, the potential for, for a woman's voice to be a compensatory measure against her, like, constant image, 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 a nation, you know, on screen and being visually objectified. Um, I have to say, I was then struck after when Anne was speaking about um, how with this festival that um, women were, you know, promoted, I, I guess, imagistically on, on this, uh, uh, you know, brochure uh, without a compensatory, you know, sonic representation. Uh, the irony is, is immense. Um, so that's just a comment on, on, on my part, but I'll, I'll go swiftly on to, to a question um, for Dr. Clear um, from Stacey Copeland, uh, who is very impressed by the impact um, and newly created funds for musicians. Um, and she's curious to hear how the term feminist in your name, in Sounding the Feminist, has been received by organizations in, in your efforts. 
Um, yeah, well, I, I should say, I think I mentioned uh, our, our, the name of the collective Signing the Feminists. I suppose it's, it's a homage to Waking the Feminists. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the, the audience tonight have heard of Waking the Feminists, but maybe internationally it might be as well known. Um, and they had achieved so much in 2016 into 17. Um, and I think we're, uh, yeah, kind of um, a leading light for so many different um, artists, uh, different mediums outside of theatre. So it, it, our, our title is a bit of a, a homage to them. Um, and then in terms of how organisations receive the, the title, um, I mean, I've never really thought about it too much because you know I, I I do believe it's something they just have to deal with and I don't really I, I suppose I'm taught I'm speaking here like with my STF hat on and also with my artist hat on where I, I kind of you know I feel like it's something they just have to deal with and it doesn't really I don't lose too much sleep over what they think about it or, or don't think about it I think it's just their job to make better decisions. Um, so yeah, it's not something I lose a lot of sleep over even to be quite frank about it. Um, we also have a, a, a kind of a, a dialogue forming on um, uh, in response to a question from Rosie White uh, directed to uh, Dr. Kay. Um, wondering what uh, what is potential spaces are um, for angry speech in television now any examples that um, you find particularly interesting um, that you'd like to comment on um, thank you yeah I mean it's a really great question and I guess I feel um, sort of sad that I can't really think of a, an equivalent kind of uh, uh, program. So you mentioned um, Loose Women, which is, um, you know, which is probably in the UK and, you know, the most sort of um, prominent uh, talk show dedicated to kind of women's issues. Um, and that is a really interesting example because um, it's clearly not kind of like feminist in, or in orientation. Um, and yet it is often construed as a kind of as a as a kind of threat to men. And um, so I did a bit of research on kind of uh, um, responses to loose women on kind of uh, um, Internet forums. And it's, you know, routinely um, referred to as kind of, you know, in, in, in highly misogynistic terms, but also as a kind of threat. You know, this kind of this idea of like the gossip is somehow like a threat to um, a threat to male power. Um, you know, and of course, there is the argument that gossip actually is a kind of threat to patriarchal power. Um, but I guess what's interesting about No Man's Land um, is that it was, you know, an explicitly feminist, angry uh, uh, programme. And, and not just feminist, but but socialist feminist, you know, it had an like explicitly kind of anti-capitalist socialist <clears throat> um, uh, ethos and focus. Um, so it just strikes me that um, in, in feminist television studies, I think like um, programs like Loose Women and also like Jerry Springer, which has also been mentioned in the, in the talk, uh, in the chat um, and other kind, of, um, other kind of talk shows are often kind of analyzed for their kind of like feminist potential and you know, what potential value they might have to a kind of feminist politics. Um, and yet, in the, in the 70s, there was, you know, an actual feminist program, you know, that was, you know, explicitly, unashamedly uh, political. Um, so, it, um, unfortunately, I can't think of an, a kind of an equivalent of that, but it would be really fantastic um, to be able to, to, to see that. And somebody also mentioned, sorry, I can't see their name now, but um, uh, whether this, whether the program could be recovered and digitized um, and made publicly um, available. And so that's something I think I'm definitely going to look into because um, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, just a kind of a really important example of how, you know, television can be a medium which, which you know, has real value for feminism of like reaching mass audiences, not, not without its problems, but, you know, it's a, you know, it is possible and it has been possible in, the hist in television's history. So, yes, so thank you for the suggestion of, of um, of, of seeing whether that is possible to digitize it. And uh, before we take, or, or have one or two more questions, um, I would say we, we do have uh, a few more minutes left. So for anybody who's participating, who'd like to 
um, ask a question, feel free to enter it in the Q and A. Um, I guess I'm kind of curious, picking up on um, Jilly, what you're saying, what you, you've said about um, nagging and you know the power of nagging and, and bitter speech. Um, how potentially maybe Megan, have you looked at nagging amongst women or by women? I, I presume in, in some respect, you know, this is um, comes up in, in studies of, of, of uh, classic films um, frequently. Um, but is do you have any any thoughts on that or is it something that you um, uh, look at? Um, probably not so much in, in this sense, because nagging would be, uh, you know, like a male coding that would be placed on it. So it'd be from the male point of view. But from a woman's point of view, it's just common sense or, you know, best practice or what you should do or, you know, something like that. So, you know, women can make short work of things and make them look really easy. And oftentimes, you know, it goes right over men's head. I mean, the be one of the best things about women's pictures is that men are shown very clearly to not be very quick on the draw. They don't really understand things and they don't have the same level of observation as women do. Um, so what seems very natural and perfectly straightforward to a woman doesn't to a man because from living in a man's world, things are so easy for him that he doesn't have to consider lots of other, you know, points of view or situations. And so it either makes him a dullard, childlike, or kind of, you know, not too bright. There's one picture of Blondie Johnson. She's a gangster who has all of these great scams figured out. And the men say things to her like, you know, um, you know, I'm not so good at thinking, you know, Blondie, you do that for me, you know? So, um, so nagging doesn't really so much enter into it because if a woman has to nag you, you are clearly the problem. And a woman's picture is gonna tell you that. Um, then it just means you're extra thick. <laughs> I like that yeah <laughs> um okay I think we're kind of um wrapping up um I just want to take one more look at the Q&A to make sure I'm not missing any important questions um I want to thank you all again so much uh for your presentations um and the questions that they've um provoked um, and um, looking forward to, to reading more and hearing more in the future. Um, do any of you have any particular questions for each other? Um, I'm wondering. Um, well, I guess I, I think I saw it in the chat as well about, about, how, about how we define feminism. And I guess that would be an interesting question to ask everybody about what, what feminism means to them in their practice and, and scholarship. Absolutely. I know it's a, it's a big question. <laughs> how do we practice this that we theorize um, frequently? Um, well, I suppose for for me, um, again, I kind of have to separate my my different hats as like uh, working with STF, which is a voluntary role, um, and then being an artist, and then also being an educator, um, uh, teaching here at TCD. There, I feel like I'm I'm a different. What my definition of feminism is is quite different in those three roles in some way. Um, I suppose in terms of STF, what I'm really advocating for is equality, um, especially from publicly funded organizations, you know, where it's taxpayers' money, um, that that um, all genders deserve the right to be heard and they deserve, um, you know, a, an adequate scale uh, in terms of um, what they can present, not like a three minute piece on a Tuesday lunchtime at the back of some location that no one can find compared to main stage Friday night live broadcasts. Like there's a very big difference. Um, so I suppose in terms of STF, I would be advocating for that kind of equality of representation, um, that, that those two platforms are very different things. Um, 
then in terms of an artist, I mean, I, I, I want, I suppose, similarly to have the right to to write about what I want to write about. Um, I think sometimes when publicly uh, you're involved with something like STF, it can often be the case that people think, oh, then you must write music about being a woman. And I think, well, <laughs> I am a woman, but like I do write music about all kinds of things. So equally, I, I'd like the right to, to write about what I want to write about. And then as an educator, I suppose I'm, I'm always thinking about ways to make the most, uh, you know, kind of egalitarian curriculum um, that I can for classes in, in every possible way. Uh, so I suppose all those things are, it's, it's looking for equality. It's not looking for women only uh, or, you know, it's, it's equality for, for all genders. I suppose that would be some, some way towards defining it in those different roles that I, I play. Absolutely. Um, and in addition, I feel like um, often a project of, of um, feminist critique, in, a, in, a, in addition to establishing equality, is this kind of um, redress or, or kind of rec reclamation of certain texts, which I feel like um, is something that Megan, your your kind of critique of of um, older films often um, might may be involved with. So finding alternative means of looking at texts um, that isn't always about saying how something um, is sexist, but how something actually can be um, reclaimed as a feminist text, as something that asserts some degree, if not um, of, of equality of um, uh, uh, of frustration with the then contemporaneous, you know, um, socio-political climate or, or what have you. Uh, I, I definitely think that that is um, part of my um, overall, you know, driving interest in doing this is putting women's stories first and not just the stories that we tell on the screen, but off screen as well. And, um, you know, the very political um, atmosphere that's in artistic production in Hollywood and during the studio system in that, you know, even in women's pictures, it's still a system that is, you know, run by men in the highest echelons and they make those decisions. So how do women create workarounds for a male system, um, for the layers of authority from studio head to producer, to director, to co-star, uh, plus all the media, you know, the, the sort of celebrity uh, columnists and whatnot that still go on today. So, you know, if, something recently like the Britney documentary is really fascinating. And you could take 10 steps back and throughout decades, look at how that sort of same approach worked with other women. In my most recent episode, I was talking about Barbara Payton, who is most known for the sort of tragic downfall that she had once she lost her film career in, you know, becoming a prostitute or that's how she's talked about. I prefer sex worker, but, um, you know, and uh, drug and alcohol addiction. But if you look at her own memoir, she has so many stories that are standouts for, um, you know, for strength and um, determination and really a rebel spirit. You know, beating a naked producer uh, uh, with a pogo stick because, you know, in the middle of an audition, she knew he was going to ask for sex. He would have these little sex scenarios to play out. And so she beat him until he was covered in red marks. And that's not discussed. What's discussed is that she turned tricks for $5. I'm more interested in beating up a producer. I mean, I haven't read anything like that. And I've read dozens and dozens of these memoirs. So the stories that we tell about women are just as important in you know, what we have to say about our own story, I think. So I, I'm looking for the good stuff. I'm looking for the ones that stick it to the man. <laughs> and Jilly, in your practice, uh, as well as a, as a feminist scholar, do you see it as, as kind of both commentary and activism as well? I mean, this commentary is activism. Right, yeah, so, yeah, it's a really good question. And uh, yes, and I guess uh, um, I would 
really hope that 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 all feminist scholarship, you know, is is really engaged with, you know, broader socio-political struggles. Um, and I would very much see uh, um, hopefully what what I do as a, as a way of contributing to kind of like to to, to public feminism in a in a in a small way and. Um, and I guess, for, well, for, and for me, um, I'm really uh, influenced by the work of um, of Nancy Fraser, who sees who sees feminism as both a kind of struggle for for recognition, but also redistribution. And so, I would see it as always needing to be kind of um, tied into kind of broader material struggles for material redistribution, and um, you know, um, those kinds of uh, politics as well. So, um, which is why I'm drawn so much to something like No Man's Land, which is, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, and, and, and thinking about the, the history of socialist feminism <clears throat> um, in relation to uh, media histories um, and sort of, uh, because uh, the, the socialist part often gets kind of often gets left out of these of these histories when we think about think about the history of mediated feminism. So, yeah, that's so for me, that's why something like No Man's Land really seems like such an important sort of text to, to kind of recover and, and, and analyze for thinking about those kinds of possibilities. Well, this brings us up basically to uh, just about to time. So um, I would like to thank again our, our panelists uh, for contributing um, uh, to this brilliant discussion. Um, and normally we'd have a round of applause, but uh, unfortunately, under the virtual circumstances, we can't. But we are all applauding from, <laughs> from our, our, our various spaces, uh, sonic spaces as well. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, and thank you for every, uh, to everybody who, um, who tuned in to participate. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>